New Apostolic Reformation. Who coined the term? It was C. Peter Wagner, longtime professor at Fuller Seminary, also a missionary before then. And in a, a fairly complete article that was posted a couple years back on Charisma magazine, he said this. I'm going to read some extensive quotes from Peter Wagner. The best I can discern, the NAR has become a tool in the hands of certain liberal opponents of the conservative candidates designed to discredit them on the basis of their friendship with certain Christian leaders supposedly affiliated with the NAR. To bolster this attempt, they seek to accuse the NAR of teaching false doctrine and paste it on the label of cult, paste on it the label of cult. So Peter Wagner's addressing this because it was coming up in political discourse with some Republican candidates. Oh, you're a part of NAR, and NAR is dominionist and trying to take over America. All right, so here's what Peter Wagner says. The NAR is not an organization. No one can join or carry a card. It has no leader. I have been called the founder, but that is not the case. One reason I might be seen as an intellectual godfather is that I might have been the first to observe the movement, given give a name to it, and describe its characteristics as I saw them. When this began to come together through my research in 1993, I was professor of church growth at Fuller Theological Seminary, where I taught for 30 years. The roots of the NAR, Peter Wagner says, go back to the beginning of the African independent church movement in 1900, the Chinese house church movement beginning in 1976, the U.S. independent charismatic movement beginning in the 1970s, and the Latin American grassroots church movement beginning around the same time. I was neither the founder nor a member of any of these movements. I was simply a professor who observed that they were the fastest growing churches in their respective regions and that they had a number of common characteristics. So he's saying, I I looked at all these different movements, some of them almost 100 years old, and tried to describe them because they had certain characteristics. And this is what Wagner was doing as a professor of church growth and missiology. So he says this, if I was going to write about this phenomenal move of the Holy Spirit, I knew I had to give it a name. I tried post-denominational, but soon dropped it because of the objections of many of my friends who were denominational executives. Then in 1994, I tested New Apostolic Reformation. Reformation because the movement matched the Protestant Reformation and world impact. Apostolic because of all the changes. The most radical one was apostolic governance, which I'll explain in due time. And new because several churches and denominations already carried the name apostolic, but they did not fit the NAR pattern. Other names of this movement, which are more or less synonymous with NAR, have been neo-Pentecostal, neo-charismatic, independent, or non-denominational, his emphasis. Now, here's what I've seen. I've seen that you have this particular theology of NAR, which Peter Wagner will articulate for us in a moment as I read the article of late Peter Wagner. Then you have the wider charismatic Pentecostal movement, and then it all gets grouped together. And then because others have grouped it together... When you say, no, no, I'm not part of it. Oh, yes, you are. Well, see, they're the ones that grouped it all together. It, it's, it's like you start the new Chinese restaurant at the food court of the mall, and you join the, the Italian restaurant, at all fast food places, and the American and the Japanese and the dessert place and all this. And then everybody in the food court of the mall is now, there, there was some bad food in the Chinese restaurant. Everybody in the food court of the mall, all the, the food court of the mall, they're all putting out bad food. No, that's not what happened. Someone grouped everyone together as if they were all the same restaurant, but only one put out the bad food. So if folks have valid issues with NAR, that's fine. Let's define it. Let's agree, disagree. I have key issues, which is why I was never part of C. Peter Wagner's organization. I respected him as a brother in the Lord, but I had differences. I did not recognize his apostolic authority or see him in that role with all respect to him. I did not believe he had the right to appoint apostolic leaders in different areas or anything like that. I didn't agree that the churches needed to be under apostolic leadership. If it worked out that they had relations like that and there was a church planting movement and they looked to a senior leader, wonderful, wonderful. Kind of a more organic thing than denominations do, but but wonderful. Great. If that's the way you relate and work things out, fine. But I never agreed with some of the tenets, but what's happened is critics have lumped it all together. And every day, I mean, oh, it's nor, nor this, nor that, nor this, nor that. I'm serious. Constantly, I'm hearing it from people. All right, so specifically, he says this about dominionism. This is C. Peter Wagner. This refers to the desire that some of my friends and I have to follow Jesus and to do what he wants. 
One of the things he does want, he taught us to pray for in the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This means that we do our best to see that we know what we know is characteristic of heaven, work its way into the warp and woof of our society here on earth. Think of heaven. No injustice, no poverty, righteousness, peace, prosperity, no disease, love, no corruption, no crime, no misery, no racism, and I could go on. Wouldn't you like your city to display those characteristics? But where does dominion come from? On the first page of the Bible, God told Adam and Eve to fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, etc. Adam and Eve and the whole human race were to take dominion over the rest of creation. But Satan entered the picture, succeeded in usurping Adam's dominion for himself, and became what Jesus calls the ruler of this world, John 14, 30. When Jesus came, he brought the kingdom of God, and he expects his kingdom-minded people to take whatever action is needed to push back the long-standing kingdom of Satan and bring the peace and prosperity of his kingdom here on earth. This is what we mean by dominionism. I don't agree with dominionism. I understand what he's saying, but we are not to rule over other people. We are to serve other people through the gospel and take authority over demonic power. Yes, in that sense, while the children of Israel drove out the Canaanites, we are to drive out demons. We are to challenge intellectual strongholds. We are to challenge worldly philosophical strongholds. We are to push back the forces of spiritual darkness in the name of Jesus as we go with him and by his authority and by his might. That we are to do. But having said that, the idea of us taking over in any way, I differ with strongly. Now, Peter Wagner does say this, a theocracy. (coughs) The usual meaning of theocracy is that a nation is run by authorized representatives of the church or its functional religious equivalent. Everyone I know in NAR would absolutely reject this idea, thinking back to Constantine's failed experiment or some of the oppressive Islamic governments today. (coughs) So he is going out of his way to say we reject that. Let me continue. The way to achieve dominion is not to become America's Taliban, but rather to have kingdom-minded people in every one of the seven mountains, religion, family, education, government, media, arts and entertainment, and business, so that they can use their influence to create an environment in which the blessings and prosperity of the kingdom of God can permeate all areas of society. So, that's his position. Not a theocracy, not Christians taking over and ruling over the world. Not that but rather influencing every area of society with the gospel. And then extra biblical revelation. Some object to the notion that God communicates directly with us, supposing that everything that God wanted to reveal, he revealed in the Bible. This cannot be true, however, because there's nothing in the Bible that says it has 66 books. It actually took God a couple of hundred years to reveal to the church which writings should be included in the Bible, which should not. That is extra biblical revelation. Even so, Catholics and Protestants still disagree on the number. Beyond that, I believe that prayer is two-way. We speak to God and expect him to speak with us. We can hear God's voice. He also reveals new things to prophets as we've seen. The one major governing, the one major rule governing any new revelation from God is that it cannot contradict what has already been written in the Bible. It may supplement it, however. I, I don't like that. I don't like that statement. And that statement is not as exaggerated as some of the critics, <coughs> excuse me, of the way they put it. But in point of fact, I don't like that statement. I would not say it like that. To me, that undercuts the authority of Scripture and does open the door to wrong type of revelatory messages. So I I differ with that. I always have differed with that. Never for a split second thought in that particular way. Yes, I believe God communicates with us. I believe he speaks to us, leads us, guides us. But the way that's said, I find to be loose. And while I agree with him in renouncing theocracy, and while I agree that we should do our best to have a positive influence in society, wherever we can, for the gospel, right? You have a local school board, and the school board's corrupt, and you can get on that school board and straighten things out, great. You've got poor and needy in your society that that the government's overlooking, and you can minister to them and help them, great. You can take a stand against unrighteousness in the media, great. We are salt and light. We do those things, but our primary weapon in changing society is the preaching of the gospel, prayer, and service. We understand that. All right, now, here's what's fascinating. One of the groups that is included as part of the New Apostolic Reformation is IHOP, International House of Prayer in Kansas City, led by Mike Bickle. So they have a statement on their website. If you just type in IHOP KC and NAR, you'll see their whole statement. They never had a formal relationship with Peter Wagner. He never spoke at one of their events, okay? 
they don't agree in using titles like apostles and prophets and, and have an elder-based government. They recognize people with apostolic and prophetic gifts, but don't believe in using titles. They have an elder-based leadership, all right? Uh, in addition to that, they are premillennial. They are premillennial. They believe before the end of the age, there'll be tremendous outpouring of judgment, and they categorically reject dominionism. They always have. There are hundreds and hundreds of their messages available that people can listen to. It is bogus to accuse them of believing things they don't, and then when they deny it, call them liars. So here, here's what uh, IHOP Casey teaches about dominion theology. We affirm that God's purpose is for Jesus to come back to fully establish his kingdom over all the earth. After the second coming, the saints will rule the earth under the leadership of Jesus Christ when he sets up his government on earth in Jerusalem and the millennial kingdom. We believe that believers in this age are called to serve Jesus in many different spheres of society, including politics, and to help establish righteousness and justice and legislation when it is possible. We are to seek to be salt and light. However, we do not believe that most of society will be Christianized before Jesus returns. We believe that all the nations will follow the Lord and obey his word after Jesus returns to establish his millennial kingdom. We deny that the church will take over all the governments of the earth before the return of Christ. In this, we would differ from others who hold to more of a triumphalist eschatology that many organs of government will become Christianized before the return of Christ. So they, they fundamentally differ with key NAR principles, and yet they get accused of being part of NAR, and when they deny it, they're called liars. That, friends, is bearing false witness against brothers. We'll be right back. 